How many of you know that today is November the 11th? And how many of you know what we do on November the 11th? We honor our veterans. Amen? And uh, I had a bunch of statistics, but I decided I didn't want to take up the time throwing them out. But there's 16, I forget, 16 million veterans still alive today or something like that. Anyway, there's a bunch of us out there. So I'd like for everybody that served in the military at any time in their life, uh, please stand up and so we can thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your service. And uh, amen. Thank you for your service, and we're going to play a song in your honor, and it's one, it's, uh, uh, the name of it is In God We Still Trust, and it was uh, written and sang by a, a cousin of my wife's a long time ago. We saw it, and I think we played it here a time or two, but, uh, but this song, I, you know, I was thinking it didn't have anything to do with Veterans Day, but it does, because what this song says can only be because of all the veterans that served and protected our country and, and the numbers that gave their lives uh, so that we could still be free. And, and, and it also goes with my sermon today, okay, because we got some work to do if we want to stay free. Amen? All right, so. How many of you had a good time so far? All right. Amen. Yeah. Who knows what we preached about last week? Well, I guess let me go get my other notes. I'll preach it again. Hello? Pardon? Amen. Amen. That was part of it. It sure was. I don't. Can you make me louder? Most people want to turn me down. They want me to be louder, Susie. Susie does such a great... That whole crew back there in that sound booth, don't they do a great job? Pardon me? Is that better? Is that all right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, uh, well, last week we preached about, uh, primarily about why our country's in the shape it's in and, and what we're, we're not fighting against flesh and blood and, and yet we seem to, to focus on that. Uh, we need to get into spiritual warfare. Uh, and we talked about Romans and, and that everybody has a chance to know God and, and if you don't uh, seek Him after He's made Himself known to you, then, then you're on a downhill slope. And that's what's wrong with our country. I think there's a lot of people that were on that downhill slope that, uh, that are, are really against God. And, and this, is a, this is a war between us and them. But we've been fighting it in the flesh and we need to start using spiritual warfare and get going with it. Amen? Uh, if not, that song that, that we heard may not long be true. I mean, we may not be able to sing a song like that if we're not careful. So anyway, since it's let me pray for I go, okay? Y'all all right with that? Father, I just thank you for this great group today. I thank you for your love and your spirit. I thank you for the great worship, Father. I thank you that you love us. And I thank you that you give us messages to, to, to try to focus us on, on bringing your kingdom to earth, Father. That's what your, your prayer says. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Father. And we want that. But I just want to stir us up a little bit to want it a little more. So just bring the message forth today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, since it's Veterans Day and we're honoring uh, men and women who served our country and, and keep us and free and, and thousands died in that process, but I think it's appropriate that we talk today uh, what we as Americans and Christians can do to keep us free and having the freedom to worship God and the freedom to bear arms and the freedoms that we've been used to all of our lives that are slowly eroding. And, and I think if we just, you know, somebody said, you know, if good men do nothing, uh, it's, it's, a bad, it's a bad result. And so I think, I just want to encourage us today a little bit, okay? So uh, 
Jesus said he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. But if we want it, we must start doing the word and not just listening to the word and being hearers. And, and too many people that go to churches today, they go and they hear and, and they never do what the Bible says. And if we want to succeed, continue to succeed, uh, how, how many of you remember that it was said by someone long, not too long ago that we are a post-Christian nation? Well, are we or are we not? You know, I think we have to make up our minds. Uh, as a whole, so far, we, we probably still are. But there are those who don't want us to be. And, and I think it's time for a wake-up call. Uh, and, and not just for us here in this little church, but it's time for, for all Americans everywhere that believe in God to wake up and let it be known. Because that's the only way we're going to retain what we have, in my humble opinion. Uh, we need a revival all over our country. We need, a big, we need the biggest revival that's ever been to hit this country. And, and those demons would go running. And some of those people might wake up and get saved. And if they don't get saved, they at least will be outnumbered so vastly that they won't be able to do any harm. Amen? Amen. So look at Second Chronicles uh, verse, chapter 7, verse 12. And this is about Solomon, but, but uh, we know that, uh, that God is no respecter of persons and that we know that what he does for one, he'll do for another, don't we? So anyway, the Lord appeared to Solomon uh, by night and he said to him, I have heard your prayer and have, chosen the, and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. You know, he didn't say if. He said when. And, and he did then. And do you think we're still having a few little things now with hurricanes and, and all the stuff that's going on? You think maybe there's a message in that for us? Uh, but when I shut up the heavens and there is no rain, or I command the locusts to devour the land, or I send pestilence among my people, he says, then if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Now my eyes, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to their prayers. Once we do that, he's going to, be, he's going to start listening to our prayers more and he's going to start giving us good answers. Amen? How many of you think there needs to be a change in our country and in our hearts as Christians? Well, you know, if, if, if one little body like this could, could really get 80 or 90 percent of us turned on and stepping it up a pace or two or three or five, uh, we might could influence enough other people to get it going, to get it started. And if there's people, you know, God doesn't just give message to preachers in one place. Uh, the, that word goes out and those that are listening here and sometimes <laughs> and sometimes uh, we find out that, that preachers in other places are, are preaching the same message that we're preaching. Amen? Uh, but anyway, it goes on. He says, For now I have chosen and sanctified this house. My name may be there forever. My eyes and ears and heart will be there perpetually. So, so what do we do and where do we start, you know, to, to change things? Huh? We start with ourselves, but what do we start doing with ourselves? He just gave us the answer. He just told us what to do, okay? So if we individually individually, one at a time, all of us one at a time, you know? If we start doing it, uh, maybe that'll be the start of, of getting something new going. So what was the first thing he said? The first thing he said was if they humble themselves. If they humble themselves. Is there anybody in here that needs some humbling? Well, if you do, I encourage you to do it yourself because when God humbles you, Sometimes it isn't fun. Amen? Amen? So 
if you know that you've got some arrogance and some pride in you and some, some ego that shouldn't be there, work on it, okay? Uh, I'm going to give you a few scriptures that speak to that. Psalms 3, th Psalms th Proverbs 3, 34 and 35 said, Surely he, is, he scorns the scornful, but he gives grace to the humble. And he added another little thing there. He said, The wise inherit glory. Well, you know, it's hard to be wise if you're not humble. How many of you know that? Usually, if you're, if you're not humble, if you're proud and arrogant, uh, your wisdom just kind of slides off of the map somewhere. So, uh, how many of you would like a little more wisdom? Uh, James 4, 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, how many of y'all said you had some pride issues? Raise your hands again if you got pride issues. Okay, let me tell you. Uh, he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And probably the ones that raised their hands aren't the worst, you know, offenders. Probably the ones that didn't raise their hand, they're too proud to tell anybody they're proud, you know. So I think it spoke to more than just that few that raised their hands. Hello? Um, he resists the proud. He resists the proud. If you ever feel like you're butting your head against a brick wall, you better check your pride out because it's probably God resisting you. Um, 1 Peter 5, 5. Likewise, you younger people. We got any younger people in here? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty young. Are y'all young? You know, just because you got gray hair and a beard, that don't mean you ain't young. It says, uh, likewise, you younger, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. And be clothed with humility. When you get up and you're putting your blouse or your shirt on in the morning and you're putting your britches up one leg at a time, that's a good time to check and say, Lord, help me to be humble today. Help me not to be full of myself. Help my life not to be all about me. Help it to be about other people. That's a, at least once a day, some of us need to wake up and say that. Amen? Because I guarantee you, the, the more humility you have, uh, the, the better off you are. Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud. Here again, if, you know, if it's in there twice, it's got to be good. Uh, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Have y'all got the humble message, or should I go on? Okay, what was the second thing? The second thing was, and pray. Humble yourselves, and then pray. It's kind of hard to pray for the right stuff if you're praying while you're full of pride and arrogance. You think so? Right. Seems to me that that's the case. So humble yourselves first and then pray. Psalms 55, 17. How often should you pray? All the time. Psalms 55, 17 says, Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. We got a battle against us, folks. For there were, and I changed it to there are, many against us. There's a lot against us as Christians. They're against God as Christians. Uh, God will hear and, and, and afflict them, even those who abide uh, from old. Selah. Because... They do not change, therefore they do not fear God. Now, how many of you have been walking in something in your life that needs changing and you haven't changed it? Well, we need to, we need to do it. We need to act on it, okay? If you go on forever without changing, it must mean you don't fear God. Because if we fear God and He puts something on our heart, don't you think we should do it? Amen? Amen? Well, don't forget, you've got to be doers of the Word, not just hearers. So listen today and then do, okay? Are y'all okay? Matthew 5, 44 says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Y'all doing that? 
Bless those who curse you. That gets a little harder, doesn't it? Do good to those who hate you. And pray for all of them. Amen? Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Hello? Hello in the sound booth? And pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes this, his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. You know what, the, you know what that's saying? It's saying don't worry about what's going on in somebody else's life. Don't think about, well, why do they get, or why do they get, why, why do they get away with this, and, or why doesn't this happen to them? Forget about it. Worry about you and doing what God tells us to do. He sends rain on the just and the unjust, and that's just the way it is. Uh, Mark 14, 38. Watch and pray. Why would you want to watch and pray? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many of you know the flesh is weak? And many of you know that, that if we try hard enough and we listen to God long enough and we humble ourselves and we watch what we say and we get in the Word and we hide the Word in our hearts, we can, we can come a whole lot closer to denying the flesh. And how many of you know that your life is better when you deny the flesh? Amen? And get, and get a hold of your feelings and squash them and don't listen to your feelings. Listen to the voice of God. Listen to the Word of God and be a doer of the Word. Amen? Amen? I may harp on that a little too much today. If I do, uh, let me know and I'll do it more. <laughs> um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Rejoice always. What does it mean to rejoice always? It means no matter what you're going through, no matter what has happened in your life, no matter what you're afraid is going to happen in your life, you rejoice in it. Why can you rejoice in it? Because God works all things together for good. So if you're going through something that doesn't feel good, all you've got to do is wait and hope and have faith and know that He's going to take care of you. Amen? And how many of you have been there and done that and it got better? Huh? It always gets better. Amen? Um, rejoice always. Pray every once in a while when you feel like it. Pray without ceasing. What does that mean and how do you do it? Is there anybody in here that really knows how to just pray without ceasing? Well, I'll tell you how to do it. You hide the Word of God in your heart and you meditate on it day and night. And, and when you're praying without ceasing, it means that He's always in your mind and you always got thoughts going through your mind about, about what to do and how to do it. And, and then He'll tell you somebody that, that needs a word of encouragement and He'll, he'll point them out to you. And, and you go do it and, and you're praying without ceasing because he's always in your thoughts and he's always in your mind. And you don't get that by sitting in a pew and going home and not doing what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. If you want that, you've got to work for it. Seek him with all your heart. That comes later. Never mind. Uh, in fact, that is next. Number three. What was number three? And seek my face. And if, if you're running from God, it's real hard to seek His face. You ever thought about that? Yeah. Did any of y'all ever run from God? Any of y'all ever hear God's voice and, and kind of play like you didn't hear it and just kind of... <laughs> that couldn't have been God. No, no, no. Devil, shut up. Huh? Hello? I'm telling you, well, I intend to. He intends to. It's not me, it's him. Don't get me mixed up in this. And seek my face. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. We do know that in the New Testament... If we truly believe in Him and we're truly saved, He can't never cast us off forever. Amen? 
because we are we are bought with the blood. We are we the blood was shed for us, and He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Neither heights nor depths nor powers nor principalities nor things present, nor things to come. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. Uh, if you seek Him, He will be found by you. But if you forsake Him, He will cast you off forever. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Now he's talking to Solomon, don't forget, and he's talking about the the, the sanctuary that, uh, that, uh, that Solomon's going to build that his daddy saved up all the materials for, but God wouldn't let him do it. But he says, he says uh, I've cho chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. And then look what he says at the end. He says, be strong and do it. Anybody hear that echo in your, in your, in your head? Maybe. You got some things in your life, or some things that God's mentioned to you, and you just need, and you know about it, and you know you're supposed to do it, and you haven't done it yet. Well, be strong and do it. Get after it. Go for it. Seek Him. Amen. Amen. Quit hiding. Second Chronicles, uh, nineteen three. Nevertheless, good things are found in you, in that you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek God. Can you seek God without preparing your heart? Can you seek God without making a commitment in your heart to, to serve Him? Uh, what was that song we sang? I will, I will follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's preparing your heart. You've got to decide to follow Jesus. You've got to decide to seek Him. You've got to decide to make Him the number one thing in your life. Uh, it's a choice. And, and you've got a choice. You can walk through life just kind of letting life push you around and letting people move you here and there and following the wrong people and, and messing with the wrong crowds. And You can just, you can just bounce around in life and, and still be a Christian. But you are not going to be the happiest Christian around. And you are not going to have a totally successful life. And God's not going to be able to use you very often to, to witness to somebody or, or to use you in any way. Don't mean He can't and don't mean He won't. But it's going to be diminished from what He wants for you. How many of you want God's best in your life? Amen. Well, work for it. Go ahead and just do it. Amen? Amen. He's there. He's done his part. He's waiting on us. Prepare your heart to see God. Matthew 6, 33. How many of y'all know what that says? How many of y'all know that's one of my very favorite scriptures? When, when I came back to God, that's the first scripture. It stuck in my heart. And I put it on my refrigerator in great big letters. And I've been working on it ever since then. And that was about 1974 probably. But when you decide to seek first the kingdom of God, I didn't, I didn't get the last half of it for maybe 50 years after that But because but, uh, I was seeking my righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And the only way you get His righteousness is how? By trusting in the blood of Jesus. By making Him your Savior and Lord. By committing your life to Him and determining in your heart to serve Him all the days of your life. Amen? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And what happens then? All of what things? All the things you've been wishing for and hoping for and praying for and wishing you could do and wishing He would do and all of that. If you seek Him first, put Him first in your life and, and, and you seek His righteousness and you know that your righteousness is filthy rags, your life will change and it will change in a way that you will be delighted with. Luke 12, 31. Uh, that was so important that he put it in two different Gospels. But seek, seek the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. I don't know why he left out the righteousness, but God must have thought we got that the first time. But seek the kingdom of God and these things shall be added to you. Hebrews eleven six. 
Am I going too fast for you? Are you soaking it in, any of it? Anybody? Hebrews 11.6, this is important. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe, what, what's, which one are we talking about? We're talking about seeking Him, right? For he who comes to God must believe that He is. How are you going to come to God if you don't believe that He is and that He's God? You have to believe that He is and He is God and He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And, and let me tell you, uh, you know, picking up your Bible once uh, every month and dusting it off and, and laying it back where you got it from, uh, that, is not, that, that is not seeking Him diligently. You know what seeking Him diligently is? It's starting to study that word. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I served God for, uh, I don't even know how many years, 30 years maybe. Uh, and I studied the Bible because I taught Sunday school and I had a home group and I even preached occasionally. But I never, I never studied the Bible to find out who God was. I studied the Bible to teach somebody a lesson that God taught uh, that would help their life. And the only lesson that He taught that will help your life is to find out who He is and what, he, what He's done for you and what makes Him tick. When you start learning about God in a personal way and studying in a personal way to find out what He says about you, to find out who He says you are and who He is, He's love and that's all He can do. And I didn't understand all of that for a long time, even though I was serving God. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So you can play hide and seek if you want to, or you can, you can you know, obey when it feels good. But if you don't diligently seek Him and listen to His voice and become a doer of the Word, you, you may have a good life, but it won't be as good a life as you can have. I promise you that. Because Jesus said, I came that you may have, a, have life and have it more abundantly. And I think that more is directly proportional to how hard you search for Him and how hard you seek for Him and how much you want Him and how much you learn about Him. Amen? Okay, what was number four? Anybody remember? Turn from your wicked ways. Now, I know nobody in here has got wicked ways, but uh, we're not all as sweet as we should be, are we? We're not all doing enough of the things that we know to do, are we? Turn from their wicked ways. Isaiah 50, verse 7. The Lord will keep me, therefore I will not be disgraced. And some of you need to write this down and think about doing it. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. You know, I think flint is, is one of the hardest stones that there is. And, uh, and when you set your face like flint to seek God with your whole heart, uh, if you really set your face like flint, you will do it. You will do it. And you will keep doing it. And that's the first step is the choice and the decision to follow Him all the days of your life in every way that you can, putting Him first in every area of your life and that's all that he wants. I mean, he doesn't want much more than that. He just wants you. He wants the totality of you. He wants all of you. He, and he wants you to be all about him. Isaiah 50, verse 7. For the Lord God will help... No, I said that one. I missed it. Luke 13, uh, verse 3. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You know, if you're born again and saved, you're not going to perish. How many of you know that? But, if there's things in your life that you know shouldn't be there, and you're just lollygagging around and letting them stay there, you may not perish, but you need to repent. 
And you, you know, everybody knows what repentance is. Don't you just get down on your knees. No, oh, God! That's not repenting. <laughs> repenting is I'm walking in the wrong direction with the wrong people doing the wrong things. And I know it's wrong because I'm a Christian and I got the Holy Spirit living in me. And all of a sudden I realize it. And I say, whoa! About face. That's repenting. It's turning from the things that you know are wrong. And, and doing what you know is right. You know, most of us in this room, if not all of us, we know right from wrong, don't we? Even, even if we don't know the Scriptures thoroughly, we still know right from wrong. We got a little, if we're saved, we got a little voice inside of us that tells us when it's wrong. And, and yet we sometimes still let the flesh intervene. And we say, well, maybe God's not looking. <laughs> you believe that? <laughs> well, don't count on it. I tell you, no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. And he'll heal your land in your body. And he'll heal your hurts in your soul. And he will, he will fill you up with his spirit and he will guide you and direct you in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So while we're doing all the above, I'm running out of time. While we're doing all the above, what should we do? How should we act? Uh, Romans 13, uh, verse 1. And this is where I left off last week. If I can find it again. I just lost my place again. Romans 13, verse 1. Put it up there. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Amen. Now, I wish I knew how that, how that worked with uh, our Congress and our Senate and so forth. I mean, what does he call it? Are those guys that are, that are making all those decisions up there and doing all that all that stuff, are, are, are they the authority? Or is the body as a whole the authority? Or is the president the authority that's over us under God? God is our authority. But He's telling us that those that are in authority were put there by Him and we're to obey Him. But we're going to learn something else in a little while. Uh, They count, and we got some here. Excuse me a minute. I couldn't do anything if I didn't have all this help, could I? Is that the next one? Oh, there you go. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what's good, and you'll have praise from them instead of being having to be afraid of them. We're just supposed to obey the laws. We're supposed to do what's right. You know, if, if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind and our neighbor by ourselves, we don't have to worry about anything else because we're doing it all right. Amen? Amen? For He is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For, if he, does, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for He is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Right. You're only going to get in trouble with any authority if you do something wrong. And sometimes authority is even harsh and, and sometimes authority is wrong, right? So what then? Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. You know, we, we shouldn't obey. Just Why do you obey God? Do you obey God just so you can go to heaven instead of hell? You ought to be obeying Him because you figure out who He is and how much He loves you and how much He sets you free and, and how much He gives you in, in, in everything that you don't deserve. Uh, we, we, ought to, we ought to be serving Him for that. 
So what's the next one? For because of this, you also pay taxes. They are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. That's their job. But God put them out there to keep us in line. He put them out there. You know, I've said many times, you know, when, when we get saved and when we trust God, we are righteous. He makes us righteous, right? We are the righteousness of God. Our life is hidden in God with Christ. And the only way that can happen is if he takes us out from under the law because we're going to mess up. How many of you know we're going to mess up as long as we're in a human body? Well, we are. But God took us out. It's in Romans. It's where it says you're dead to the law, sin, and death. He takes us out from under the law, but he gave us somebody to punish us when we do wrong. He didn't want to punish us anymore. He was like my daddy. My daddy never wanted to spank me, and my mama tried to make him one time, and he took me in the bathroom, and he put his belt on the toilet seat, and he swatted the toilet seat, and he said, you better cry, boy, or I'll have to really hit you. <laughs> and, and, and I think he had to talk with my mother after that because he ne she never tried to get him to spank me again, and he never laid a finger on me again. Amen? That's God. God didn't want to spank us. He didn't want to punish us. He didn't want to have to, but he knew we would need punishing, so he set it up so he didn't have to do it. Isn't that great? That ought to be worth the amen, I think. Okay. That's just my opinion, I guess. It's God's word, but uh, where are we, Susie? Or Betty? Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no one anything except what? Love. Owe no one anything except to love one another for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Amen. I'm telling you, uh, God is good and, and he, wants us, he wants us to enjoy our life. For the commandment, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. Y'all don't do any of those things. If there's any other commandment, they're all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. If, you just, if you just do that, you don't, you don't have to worry about whether you're sinning or not. You just don't focus on not sinning. Focus on on doing good and doing right, making good choices and all way. And you'll never have to have a bad conscience. I mean, there is therefore now no condemnation for you because you're in Christ Jesus. But how many of you still, you know, hurt somebody's feelings and you feel guilty about it? Well, if you didn't hurt their feelings in the first place, if you were, you, if you were loving them, you wouldn't hurt their feelings, right? And if you didn't hurt their feelings, you wouldn't have to worry about no condemnation, right? Even though God doesn't condemn us. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus fulfilled the law for us because He is love. He had no choice. God is love. And He has no choice but to love us. That means to act right towards us. Uh, and He always acts right towards us. Of course, He knows a whole lot more than we do and he knows when to say yes and when to say no because it's good for us. And he might say no to some things you've been wanting uh, because he knows it's not good for you. He's, he's a parent that, that makes good choices all the time and he doesn't let the kids learn bad habits and, and he, he wants to give them what's good but he's not going to give them what will harm them. Amen? Sometimes he'll let you run, run headlong into it anyway because you don't listen to him. And then you get yourself in trouble. Amen? Amen. Hmm? Is that it? Oh. Well, let me find this one. I can't hear you. Oh, okay. Here, go, to, go to Acts 4.18. This is the one I needed to remember. Acts 4.18. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. That's, they, had them, they had them 
in jail and they were giving them a trial and and they couldn't uh, they couldn't couldn't get anything going so they just they were going to have to let them go and they commanded them not to speak in the name of Jesus so what did they do but Peter and John answered and said to them whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge there's a place when our leaders start telling us to do things that are absolutely diametrically opposed to God's Word, that we have to say, I'm sorry, authority, but you may put me in jail, but I have to do what God said. And, and we better get ready for that, because if we don't get this revival going in this country someday, I hope way down the road, uh, they may be putting us in jail for not doing what they say or for, for not doing what's against God. And, and we better be ready. Is there another one? We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. i got to learn not to put my finger in the wrong place on this thing. Hmm? So when we had further threatened, when, when they had further threatened them, yeah, this is good. When they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them. Why? Because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. And that's the final word. Amen? Amen. Did, you, did you hear that? Yes. They, they threatened them. For the man, this, the, this was where they, he, Jesus had healed the, old, the 40 year old man, or the, the disciples had. And uh, the, the guy was over 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing had been performed. And they were all excited about it. And, they, and being let go, they went to their own comp companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders said to them. They didn't listen to what the, what the rulers said. So when they heard that they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are, you are God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in it, them by whom is in them, whom by the mouth of your servant David said, why did the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth, this is why, and this is what's going on right here in our, in our world today, the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. That's what's wrong in our country. That's what's wrong with the world is they've gathered together against God. And we can't fight against flesh and blood when, when that's going on. We have to get on our knees. We have to band together. We have to, to, to bring this country back to God in a big way, in, in mass numbers. That's the only way that it can happen. And that's a spiritual battle. That's not a flesh and blood battle. It's a spiritual battle. And I'm praying that there's preachers all over the country that are, that are preaching something similar to this today. And that if enough people get it and start in each little circle, in each little circle, it'll get better. Amen? Uh, I'm good for that. Just a minute, let me get to Hi, greetings in the name of our Lord. I'm coming from Malaysia, second time around. Two years ago I was here, I'm very blessed. You all received me with the same warmth as if I look so different, but you embrace me just like another brother of yours. Thank you. But as Pastor Jerry was preaching, my hair stood on ends. Because this year, if you talk to any Malaysian, 509, it's not just some number in the lotto, May 9th, 61 years of corrupt leadership, of uh, persecution. We have pastors disappearing, Pastor Raymond Cole. You can read it up. We still couldn't find him in the last regime. They lynch pastors. 
because they were converting Muslims in my country. In Malaysia, you are free to come and meet me later. My passport I've showed you. I can go to any country except Israel. So my dream was to go to where Christ really ministered. But it doesn't matter because whatever it is, like what Pastor Jerry was sharing, your country is going through the same. We are praying for your country. The unbelievable has happened. President Trump, whether you like or you don't, is now leading your country. At least for once, you're pushing back the demonic forces you don't see. We are seeing that. As one body, we feel it because in, in Malaysia, two-thirds are actually Muslims. Uh, One-third are non-Muslims. Christians are 5 to 6%. But we pray and we fast, 40-day prayers, churches all around, we rally together, 5 6% Christians. But if you rally together, you believe in God. It doesn't matter. We have Muslim leaders who are corrupt. 700 million US dollars banked into his personal bank account. And he says it's a donation from Saudi, from Saudi royal. And he thinks he can do anything. The attorney general wanted to persecute him. He removed him. A judge, he put in the right judge. He kept that going for almost 10 years. But you know what? We have our own Ronald Reagan. He's still kicking. <laughs> so, Mahade, he's also Muslim. But he left office in 2003 as a 70-something-year-old man. He comes back to unite the country being Muslims. The Muslims who could not take the amount of corruption, the unrighteousness, the evil ways of the, of the enemy really corrupting the whole country and persecuting Christians and churches and even non-Muslims. This old man came back at the age of 92. It's like your Ronald Reagan, but this guy is still kicking, right? So at 92, he led the Muslims who are more righteous, who cannot stand these evil ways to come together with this opposition, they were all opposition, they became opposition, and they fight. Together with the Christians, we fight and we pray. Guess what? 509, May 9th, history is made. 61 years of corrupt leadership was overthrown. And today, the things we never dream of, we have Christians who are in opposition, now in leadership. Let me... Let me just read for you. In October 31st, it was just five months down the road, it came in a newspaper. My hair is standing as I'm telling you this because it's an impossible thing to see in the papers, national papers. Christian lawmakers pledge to combat graft. This is a Muslim country that prohibit me to go to Israel. They appoint Christian leaders to combat graft. Graft means corruption. We now have... 12 ministers or deputy ministers in office. They are still getting used to it because they used to be in opposition. They used to be on their knees praying. And these are the same people they throw in jail. Our finance minister today is a Christian guy who was thrown in jail 20 years ago. Now, I'm just saying, what are the chances? And this Malaysian guy sitting in this church, my hair all standing as Pastor Jerry is preaching. Everything that you heard... It's not by coincidence. Matthew 6.33, truly you seek the Lord with all your heart and, and His righteousness. All these things shall be added to you. The churches around the world are praying for America. You already made the turning point. Many people hate Him. Guess what? Do all, do you think the enemy loves us? It doesn't matter. I can tell you one thing. If they don't hate you, you're not doing something right. Amen. Right? So I have only this to say. If a 93-year-old man can come back from the dead, he's not dead, but he's still leading the country. He's the oldest prime minister in the whole world. The impossible has happened. And getting Christians to really lead on matters relating to women and well-being, you hear in the... In the in the Muslim world, they get little kids getting married. One kid got married at the age of nine. Muslims and non-Muslims together, we stood up and we fight against that. That person was already married to this nine-year-old. He's 44. He's got already a wife. We fought and now he cannot 
be with the wife until she's 16. Something. It's not the best, but at least we just stand up. You just stand up by kneeling down. Yes. We kneel with you. We pray with you. We never stop. Because each one of us, as long as we unite wherever we are, we are in spirit together. So for that, we thank you. Thank you. Continue. Be unceasing. We also pray for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I used to love that, uh, I still do, that song that our worship team has sang many times. Down on my knees, I learned to stand. So how many of you still glad you came to church? How many of you going to start doing something different? Amen. If you raised your hand, that's a commitment to God. And, and it ain't... It ain't good to, to make a vow to God. Not right now, John. Uh, it ain't good to make a, a vow to God and not, and not do it. Amen? Amen? So my question for you today is, how many of you that are here know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Is there anybody here who's never trusted Jesus in a personal way? You know, it's, it's a relationship. It's, it's just like, you know, I met John one day and, and we introduced ourselves and, and I didn't know who he was or anything about him, but I had to meet him before I could get to know him really well. And, and sometimes God puts it on our hearts and sometimes people are thinking, well, I, I don't know enough, you know, I don't know enough about him. I'm, you know, I'm still a sinner and I can't, I can't meet him right now, you know. Well, that's the lie. He's waiting for you with open arms. All he wants you to do is acknowledge that he's God and that he died for your sins. And, and invite Him to forgive your sins and to, to, to rule your life. So if that's you today and you're not absolutely sure that if you died tonight you'd go to heaven, raise your hand up and let me introduce you to the, the best thing that will ever happen to you. Anybody, anywhere? Well, praise the Lord. I guess God brought us all together as believers to hear this word today. Amen? Amen. So, well... <clears throat> We got a job to do, and I hope we can bond together and do it. And, and I really appreciate the, uh, the stamp that was put on it and, and the testimony that came. I believe it was a word from God. Amen. So, amen. If it is, it's from Him, it's not from me. So, uh, come to church. Amen. Well, we've got a guest coming next week that's very special from what I understand. So how many of you going to be back? All right. Well, how do you know when you've been to a cowboy church? Oh, 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 oh. We're even, Brother Dennis. We're having communion today. Aren't y'all glad there's somebody here to keep me straight? If y'all aren't glad that they're here to keep me straight, I am. So, and y'all ought to be. Amen. But, but I sure do like to preach and I sure do like to serve in this church and I sure do love you people. Amen. Amen. Well, we have what we call open communion and that simply means that if you're a child of the Most High God and you're a born again uh, Christian, you're welcome. That is the church, is the born-again believers. So it doesn't matter whether you come to Cowboys for Jesus routinely or not, you're welcome to partake with us. So if one person from each family will come up and, uh, and get the sacraments, we have, you know, there's, there's healing in communion. There's healing in Christ. And as we remember Christ, uh, I believe it was Paula that said, talked about the healing this morning. And this is a good time to, as you take communion just to, to trust God for your healing for whatever's going on in your life, whether it's emotional or physical or, or mental or whatever it is. God wants to heal it. He wants you free. But, but you get free by, by, by surrendering to Him, by submitting to Him, and by all the things we talked about today. Those are the things that make you free. 
And, and this is, is just the icing on the cake. He says, remember, do this in remembrance of me until I come again. He, how many of you know he's coming again? Amen. How many of you want it to be tomorrow? Or today? Amen. Well, we don't know when it's going to be, but we need to be ready. And we're ready by, by preparing. So, uh, Jesus told his disciples, he said, he said, take and eat this. And remember, this is my body that was broken for you. And, and do this remembering me until I come again. And then he blessed it and then they partook. So Father, I just thank you for the, for the body of Jesus that was, that was beat so badly and, and tortured for us and by the stripes that, that are for our healing, Father. And I thank you for, for, for him and all that he did for us, Father. And we just bless you. And we, we, we ask you to bless this, this service today and this, and this meal that we're partaking of. And I ask for healing, Father, for all those who have hurts, habits, hang-ups, uh, emotional problems, spiritual problems, any kind of problem, Father. I ask you to set us all free today and let us live a freer life because we came here today and because we got a little more faith in you from your word. And we just say in Jesus' name, amen. And then he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood which was shed for you. And it's that precious blood that paid the penalty for our sins. And, uh, and he said the same thing. He said, do this in remembrance of me until I come again. But let's bless it. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the blood that was shed. And we thank you for the life that came out of it, Father, for us. The blessed life, Father, the abundant life, Father. Jesus died and shed that blood so that we can have life and have it more abundantly, Father. And Lord, I pray for anyone in this room that's not having the abundant life that you want for them, that they'll wake up and they'll start seeking your face, Father, with all their might and with all their strength. And I pray that you'll set them free and minister life and peace and health to them, Father. But we do this today, remembering our Savior and all that he did for us as he died on that cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> amen.